is The Big Douglas Show, and my guest today from PFF, data scientist and host of the Unexpected Points podcast, Kevin Cole. Kevin, how are you? I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I thought I'd start out by asking you how long you've been with PFF and kind of how you got hooked up with those guys. Sure, sure. I think we're going on about three years now with PFF. Uh, my route to PFF is a little, I don't know, circuitous. Like I started off doing finance work and I was doing that stuff for a while. I got into some things on more of the sports analytics side with like the money ball revolution and that sort of stuff was doing fantasy football work, really quantitative sort of stuff there. And then it just bridged into more and more of my focus became uh, football as opposed to the other sports and more and more it became looking at some of the analytical aspects of you know quote unquote real football as opposed to fantasy football although I still do a decent amount of fantasy football work well let's sign we did that today brought you on for the fantasy football today it's our first episode getting people ready to win their fantasy football leagues what do you think is the most popular version of fantasy football right now yeah, I don't know. I think there's probably a divide between what some people would call like a casual league. So something that you're playing with your friends or with people at your work or you've had extending for a long time. And those that play, uh, you know, for some of these leagues for money, some of these leagues with with people that are doing, you know, 30, 40 different drafts in the offseason to try to to try to run there. So I think the most the most common league is probably your standard 12 team league. Now, PPR has become one of the more dominant formats, like I said, amongst these sort of experts. But I think for casual leagues, it really ranges all over the place. Some of them give a point per reception, some of them don't, but it really changes the reflection of, uh, especially the running back position when you have to worry about whether or not they're going to catch passes. Well, uh, that leads me to one of the questions I had for you is, is running back used to always be, you know, you took running back one, two, three, and four. Yeah. Uh, is that still the way that we're looking at things now or with the, with the passing league and the PPR method, is that antiquated now? Yeah, I, I think it's still the way that we're looking at it. I mean, there's still really a scarcity of top top running backs. So those guys are really near the top. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, for instance, Christian McCaffrey or Dalvin Cook th this year, uh, Alvin Kamara, depending upon whether you think it's, it's still going to be a similar situation there. I mean, those are guys that not only are they still near their top, but they've really transitioned their games to – getting a lot of reception work also, right? So the PPR uh, factor doesn't damage them as much. And I think there's just been a shift over the course of the last several years where the running back position generally went through a little bit of a downtrend where you had Adrian Peterson there. You didn't have a lot of other big names for a while. Now we've seen big draft picks that have come through the system, whether it's Derrick Henry, whether it's Saquon Barkley, Christian McCaffrey, all these big names that have come through. Todd Gurley, you know, when he was big a few years ago, these are top draft picks that have come through and really replenished the position. Whereas for the receiver side, there have been a lot of busts on first round early receiver picks and the receiving games are spread out so much now that your typical lead receiver on a particular team is still getting a decent amount of, of targets is still seeing the ball as much, but it's not as dominant as it used to be because you have slot receivers, other guys who are really functioning in that in the passing game and you have receipt and you have the running backs who are taking a decent amount of those passes too. How do we look at target shares? Uh, and, excuse me, and for like a guy like McCaffrey, or not McCaffrey, uh, but Kamara, uh, we don't know, you know, the new quarterback. How do we look at a guy like that? Are you concerned by the quarterback? Or history shows that draft him, he's getting the ball. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm concerned a bit. Uh, there's always like a – you don't know how much of it is the system underneath Sean Payton, how much of it is Drew Brees, but Brees is someone who throughout their career was a top five guy in terms of the percentage of time that he targeted the running backs. And it's not just, it's not like an Alex Smith situation where he's dumping the ball off. These are situations where he makes very quick reads and he decides to make his first or or just a very quick pivot on his read to the running back immediately and throw the ball there. So it was really high. And sometimes when people switch teams, that can be affected a bit by coaching. But if Philip Rivers is another great example, he was someone who really targeted the running backs a lot 
when he was in San Diego and in LA for, I guess, a, a season. And then when he came over to playing for the Colts last season, it didn't change. He was still a top five guy. So I think with Taysom Hill in there, he's going to tuck it. He's going to run a lot more than he's going to, than he's going to dump off to those guys. If he is a starting quarterback. And then Jameis Winston is another guy where he was really known for pushing the ball down the field. He was one of the high average depth of target guys. He's, he's a risk taker, right? He was, he put up the, the 30, 30, uh, 30 touchdowns, 30 interception season, just a couple of years ago so can Peyton you know moderate his game it, it's, it's possible we saw it happen with with Cam Newton in 2018 when he had a new system there and he threw the ball a lot to uh, Christian McCaffrey where he hadn't thrown a lot to running backs in the past so I think it's possible but I would definitely discount uh, Kamara for that reason and also with Michael Thomas what what does that do to his to his stock uh, because it feels like just a season or two ago he was WR1 it does not feel like that this year, does it? No, it definitely does not. I mean, if we look at, I'm just pulling up some recent rankings that we have in these best ball leagues that are going on during the summer. Yeah, so Thomas is wide receiver nine. And like you said, he had those incredible seasons where he was getting, you know, 200 targets and he had the most receptions ever, right, in, in a season. So he's not anywhere near that. He would have been the number one guy taken, especially in, in a PPR league. So there's a big discount there. Now, surprisingly, when Taysom Hill played, Thomas didn't suffer as much as someone like Kamara. There was a situation where some of those short passes were taken off and they were replaced by the fact that Hill would want to run, but he still was targeting Thomas a lot. And in, in some ways, the fact that he's not necessarily a natural guy to go through his progressions, he might just look at, for Thomas, look for it and pass it if it's available right. and then run if not. So I think Thomas could be a little bit of a value around that wide receiver nine, wide receiver 10, but because there is so much of a discount already priced into that. You mentioned best ball. That feels like it's something fairly new. I was hoping you'd kind of run the, uh, through that for the folks at home that might not be up to date on what that is. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, this started a number of years ago, but it's gotten a little bit better, I think, with technology and people's abilities to draft off of their phone, where it really is during the entire offseason. It's a format where you draft these players, and but during the season, there's nothing to worry about. Once the draft is over, you're not doing anything beyond that point because what will happen is each week after the week is completed, the, the format will go in. It'll find the right players to put in who have the highest score. So let's say you start one quarterback in these leagues, right? So it'll say what quarterback on your roster has the highest score. That's your quarterback for the week. Let's say you need, you need a couple of running backs. It'll say which two running backs did you have with the highest scores. It'll slot them in wide receivers, tight end, and so on uh, defense, you know, and, and kicker in some of these leagues too. So it puts all of that in for you. And then at the end of the year, it sees who has the most points. And depending upon the format, it can either be you win that league. So you win the largest pot of money going in for that 12 team league. And they have other formats now where hundreds and thousands of teams are all competing in a big tournament. And if you can win that entire tournament, then, then, then you can do it. But this is something where you can participate in literally tens, hundreds of drafts during the off season. And then that's it. You don't have to worry about every Wednesday night, pulling your hair out, trying to decide who to put into the game, who to pick off the waiver wire, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's made it fun and it really gets a way to get people engaged. So you can get good ADP information, good, good information on who's, who's hot, who's not during the entire off season, because people are betting with their own money here. So it's not like a mock draft where they're just clicking on whoever were the high uh, draft picks the previous year. I think it's interesting. There are the the crowd that you know does their you know work league and they look forward to doing one a year, and then there's the fantasy football community you know that is doing. I think people would be stunned. How many drafts have you done so far this year, ballpark? Oh, I mean, ballpark for me, it's somewhere around twenty five thirty, but. I mean, I'd say for some people that's on the low side, right. <laughs> some people are, they're almost, they're almost like a bot. They have to constantly be, uh, be clicking and drafting. Some people have even set up ways to automatically draft these. If they just go based upon a preset list that, that they're doing it here and they get a ton of volume. So yeah, yeah. It's definitely something that caters more towards the off season for people who may like to play DFS or, or something like that. People really need to have like a stake involved in it. It gives them something to do during the summer and to keep up on the news for the NFL. It feels like I have heard the term stacking more this year than in previous years. Run us through that real quick and tell me what you like about it. Yeah, yeah. So the, the concept of stacking is having multiple players from the same team. So wanting to do that purposefully. 
And the traditional way that we talk about that normally is having a quarterback and having one, two, even three receivers on that, on that same team. So every time that quarterback throws a touchdown, if you have the receiver, you're getting two touchdowns there, right? So what in a lot of these leagues, what you're trying to do is you don't really care so much as to whether or not you're an average team, an above average team, or the worst team in the league. That doesn't matter. What matters is either winning that particular league or winning this big tournament. So what you want to do is you want to get these very, very high outcomes. So you want to take a lot of risk. So what you're doing is you're kind of concentrating your risk on a particular passing game. And if a quarterback outperforms how well he's going to do, it's likely that those receivers are also going to do better than how well they were supposed to do. So when you combine all that together, it gives you a better chance of getting a high, high outcome. And in some of these tournaments, what happens is uh, you, you go into a playoff format where it's just based upon the results of the last couple of weeks of the season. So in those weeks, you really, really want to concentrate. And if you had, if there's a particular game, like Mahomes throws five touchdowns and, and he throws a, uh, three of them to Travis Kelsey. If you don't have Mahomes and Kelsey together, you're not going to win. So you need to have those stacks and you want to find those games. So yeah, I think it's become more and more known that those are stuff. Those are things that you really, really need not to just perform better than what draft position is concerned, but really to win those leagues. It's going to give you a better chance of doing that. It feels also Kevin, like in years past it, everybody was talking about, you know, picking up the handcuff. It seems more and more like, like people that do this, say, don't do that. You're wasting a pick. Where do you stand on that? Yeah. Again, it comes down to this, like, what, what are you trying to accomplish? I mean, if you're in a league where you're playing week by week, you're able to substitute in and out on waivers. Uh, you may want to have some protection if you have a deep bench, but if you're playing in one of these leagues, like uh, these best ball leagues, let's say, if you have, um, I don't know who, who would you have in this circumstance? I don't even know who Christian McCaffrey's handcuff is now, but let's say you had Dalvin cook and you had Alexander Madison or someone like that. Is there, is there a handcuff? So if, if you're, if you're trying to win these leagues, Madison only becomes valuable. If cook gets injured, if cook your pick, who's probably the top three pick in the league, if he gets injured, you're probably not winning the league anyway, right? You're, it's more like you're, you're hedging your loss and hedging your loss. Doesn't, doesn't help. So I think it's really there's been this paradigm shift where it's been caused by DFS and by these best ball leagues, where there's a paradigm shift where people are more and more concerned with winning as opposed to uh, hedging and, and setting a floor for your team. And so handcuffing is a hedge, is a hedging, hedging strategy. It's not uh, increasing your chance of being the best out of 12 team strategy. Every year, everybody's hoping to pick first and ends up picking last. What is the strategy that you like using for the very first pick compared to the last pick? And I guess while we're at it, the, the guy that always says, I'm stuck right in the middle and I hate that. Where, where do you like picking from and, and does it matter? Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely matters. I mean, traditionally, there has been an advantage to drafting early uh, because typically there are two, three, maybe four uh, running backs, right? We're talking about the traditional traditional drafts. And again, it's, it's the case this year who are a cut above the rest. So if you have those guys, you get that pick, you get a pick at the end of the second round, and then you get a pick at the beginning of the third round. So you're drafting again. So, so you're drafting first, you're getting that third pick before those other teams are getting the third pick. So that those two things combined are, are quite an advantage. I think that is the case this year. I mean, Christian McCaffrey, I know that he was injured last year, but there was zero indication that anything would change as far as the amount of volume that he's getting. So I think he's a really, really high pick. I think Dalvin Cook is another guy who's a very, very high pick. Beyond that, almost everyone has some question marks there. So I don't mind beyond that, whether it's the end of the first round, because sometimes you can you can get together a, a couple of really, really high picks at the end of the first round. You get a pretty good running back and maybe a pretty good receiver. You can get one of the top two or three receivers at, at that point. So I don't mind that. I don't mind picking in the middle. But I still think the beginning has an advantage and and some you know some leagues have even done things to try to mitigate that advantage where they switch the order in the third round so that if you're drafting um first and then the end of the second round then you don't draft until the end of the third round to try to mitigate that but again that's something that you don't see that often because there really is an advantage to drafting early uh if you had that number one pick who are you taking 
Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, I'm going to take whoever else is taking. I'm going to take Christian, Christian McCaffrey. Uh, like I said, there's really no holes in his game other than the fact that there is a new quarterback. So with Sam Darnold, we don't really know whether or not he's going to be a player who's going to to dump it off as much and to use him as much in the passing game. But I don't think Darnold, and there's no indication that Darnold won't be that guy. So the, the big concerns with McCaffrey would be a complete blow up of the offense uh, with Darnold there. But we saw that the, the floor the ceiling was still there with Teddy Bridgewater last year and I don't see any reason for that to change where do you stand every year I try to convince myself to wait on quarterback and then I always get excited and take Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers you know with my with my first pick there where do you stand on that yeah I mean I'm definitely a wait on quarterback type I think it really depends more than anything on the league that you're playing in. I mean, some leagues you're going to see quarterbacks go, who knows at the end of the first round, maybe even, or, or, or the second round, something like that. In those type of leagues, I think it's safe to, to lay off on it. Uh, I mean, the quarterback position is just really, really deep. And the, the NFL also has a lot of quarterbacks who can produce on the ground. They can get running uh, advantage on the ground. And that just, that just makes a really, really big difference. Now, this season, there are particular, you know, a few in the draft that can that can do that when we're talking about fields and we talk about Trey Lance. We don't know if they're going to play for week one, but it's just adding more and more players who are viable fantasy quarterbacks. And I think for that reason, it pays to, to wait most of the time. I was seeing this in a couple of drafts I've done here recently. It feels like, and maybe it's excitement for something new, that that the rookies are getting a bump over some of the younger players in the league. Have you seen that? And and what do you think is the cause for that? Yeah, I've definitely seen that. I mean, I think it's a reflection on what happened in the NFL draft, right? Where we had the first eight picks. I want to say we're all offensive players. I mean, there's an offensive lineman in there in there too, but it's a lot of skill position players who went early. I mean, we had multiple receivers go in the top 10. We haven't had that for a while. We had two first round running backs, which doesn't sound like a lot, but there was, you know, there's only one. And that was the 32nd pick the year before. Um, there were also a few wide receivers who were taken in the second half of the first round and the, and the beginning of the second round. So I think it's, it's somewhat a reflection of that. Um, there we have, the effect of someone like Justin Jefferson doing so well last year that people are going to say, Hey, if Jeff, you know, they do this like logical proof, almost like if Jeff, Justin Jefferson, you can have the greatest wide receiver season ever. And Jamar chase was better than Justin Jefferson when they were in college together, then Jamar chase will have an even better season. So it's, it's, it's those sorts of things that we've seen. Saquon Barkley as a rookie was the number one running back in uh, fantasy football a, a couple of years ago. So I, I think there's been some proven performance, but I would say generally, especially with the wide receiver position, there there's risk to taking these rookies because while it can be a position where you have an Odo Beckham type of season, you have a Justin Jefferson type of season. Generally, those are positions that break out in the second year. So I think it, it's much better to try to find second or third year receivers who can be cheap. Maybe people are not as excited about them. Then look for those, those rookies because quite often they're overpriced, uh, at least the receivers. Do you think Trey Lance will start uh, game one I, I have contended for a while I think they gave up a whole lot of capital to sit a guy that long yeah I mean as long as they have Garoppolo probably not uh, I mean it's really tough to say in these situations because the, the the talk has been that he's ready to start but I can see situations where coaches will say you know what we don't want to go we don't want to go from rookie starter back to veteran starter so we'll play the veteran We'll see how things go, and then we'll make that transition based upon the record. So I'd say it's about a 50-50 chance either way. I mean, I think that we, we have a situation, at least we know that Lawrence and Wilson, you know, Wilson is, is competing with two guys who have never thrown an NFL pass in a, in, in a game. So I think I think he's gonna, those guys are going to start week one. We've heard the Andy Dalton talk. Now, Shanahan hasn't been as – definitive as Matt Nagy was talking about Andy Dalton, but at the same time, they're keeping him around and they're paying him uh, 20 odd million dollars where they could cut him with no cost at all. They could cut Garoppolo with no cost at all. So the fact that they haven't done it says something to me. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Why don't, uh, do you have some sleepers that you like maybe mid late round gems that you're looking at that people may not be familiar with? Yeah. I mean, I think for the running back position in particular, it's somewhere what I normally like to do is find different situations that are a little bit 
what we call like ambiguous. Like you don't know who the top guy is going to be. Cause what you've seen often throughout time is you either benefit from having a, a top notch running back, or you benefit from having a guy where you don't know who the starter is going to be and they can emerge some way. Now the handcuffs, they can pay off in certain situations uh, like a D'Angelo Williams, a few years ago playing behind Le'Veon Bell, but generally that's not, that, that's not the way that it ends up working. So I think when you look at different, different backfields, the, the Niners backfield is pretty interesting right now. I think Trey Sermon, if you like him, if you like Raheem Mostert, if you like any of those guys, I think those are guys where you just don't know what's going to end up happening. And if you end up drafting them, uh, things can kind of fall in your way, which I think is interesting. Uh, Miles Sanders is another guy I'm somewhat interested in only because he's really become very unpopular after being quite popular (laughs) the last, the last couple of years. So it's more of a play on, Hey, this guy's probably the lead back there. They drafted uh, Kenneth Gainwell, but I think it was in the fifth round. So it's not like they invested a ton of capital on him, but people seem to be interested there. And if you even want to go, you know, further, further down, I think if you're looking at anyone on the Miami Dolphins, like a really sleeper, sleeper type, I think someone like Malcolm Brown is at least a little bit interesting because again, they have Miles Gaskin there. They had this guy, Salva and Ahmed, who did well last year. Uh, not big names. So we just don't know who the, who the guy is going to be there. And the fact that Malcolm Brown is someone who could come in and probably play pretty well is an interesting name. So I say, those are probably the guys at the running back position. Kevin, let's wrap up. We do, uh, this is a Washington football team podcast. So let's wrap sure. up with some of the guys on there. Let's start with the quarterback. He's set up to have a really big year, right? I mean, I, I know people are, you know, fits magic versus fits tragic, but the numbers really support the fact that he ought to be able to put up some big numbers this year. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. You know, I was just looking through this morning and I have this, we have this stat that we go by called expected points added, which is kind of an analytical way of looking at things, but you know, he hasn't had the, the full season every single season, but if we go back from 2013 until now, He's had one, two, three, four, five different seasons where he's been like a top 10, top 11 guy of that stat, if you believe it or not. Like, it's amazing. And we're talking about uh, the last three seasons. He was like, he was in the top five for a shortened season because he didn't play. He was going back and forth with Jameis Winston in 2018. He was in the top 10 last year. And I think it's hard to argue that he's going to have a worse circumstance now. Uh, The thing is, there are going to be ups and there are going to be downs. So uh, if you can live through that, I think that's good. It's, you know, it's kind of like, He's a very, very rich man's Kyle Allen in some ways, because Allen's a guy that would make a lot of mistakes, very different from Alex Smith, but he has such upside here uh, with the infusion of talent that it's, it's exciting because the, the defense was a top five defense last year. The fantasy football community this year is super high on Antonio Gibson. How do you, how do you see him um, and what he's got coming this year? Yeah, I, mean, I think he's, he's done he's got everything that you would want as far as someone who's coming into the second season. He had the production last year. He's got the size. He's got everything else. The only thing that concerns me a little bit with him is the fact that he has this one NFL season. You you can't be quite as sure because in college, he was really functioned more as a wide receiver than he did as a running back. We haven't seen a whole lot for him, but there isn't a lot of competition there. I mean, we've saw some, we have some, you know, best best shape ever uh, stories coming out for J.D. McKissick, who's supposedly gained weight, and they have some other guys there. Um, I mean, very, very sneaky if anyone playing here plays in a dynasty league and they want someone at the end, end of their roster. I really like Jarrett Patterson a lot, quite honestly, the UDFA that they, that they brought in. I mean, just a production monster. So uh, it, it wouldn't, I guess it's one of those things where I'd be less surprised if he didn't end up being the man than for some of the other players who were drafted in that range. But I, I don't disagree with people that think he has just tremendous upside because he has the receiving ability and he's a 220 something pound guy. So it's not like he doesn't have the size also. It's interesting. You mentioned McKissick and obviously I can't imagine he'll do it again, but 80 receptions last year. I mean, it was just incredible to think that how many receptions he got. Uh, they, they've added a lot to the wide receiver room. What does that tend to do to a guy like McLaurin when you add in a, a Samuels and, and a Humphreys and a Deami Brown if he gets going this year and, and plays well? Does that tend to affect the receivers in that way or no? Because I know people are still real high on McLaurin as well. I mean, I think it does. I mean, people have all these different opinions about whether or not, you know, bringing in more talent can increase the efficiency or it takes the defense away, which then allows, uh, you know, someone like McLaurin to play 
a little bit freer than he would if the defense was concentrating on. I, I think you could go 50 different directions if you wanted to think about all the different ways. For me, it's pretty simple. The more talent there is, the the more different places the quarterback can throw the ball that's not that receiver so that's bad like i think if, if you're going to want anything you want a lot of volume i mean we've seen just tremendous tremendous seasons from wide receivers whether it's i don't know josh gordon back when in his second season or whether it was deandre hopkins a number of years ago he's playing with houston and there was no one else there um where you can have tremendous season without much competition there and the, the quarterback can get you the ball. I mean, defenses are, can try to take you away to a certain degree, but I don't think they can to that much. So for, for me, I think it's a little bit of a negative for, for McLaurin, the fact that these other receivers are around. At the same time, he, you know, he's not someone who's being drafted, at least now, in, in the top 10. So at least he has a little bit more touchdown potential here with Ryan Fitzpatrick. And the last one, real quick before we get to Logan Thomas, who really had a yeah. great year last year. Uh, it seemed like, uh, individual defensive player was like making a move a couple of years ago. Feels like that is not something a ton of people are doing anymore. Is that true? Why do you think that was? Yeah. I mean, I think it was an interesting wrinkle to bring more uh, optionality and more of a focus for season long leagues, but just the entire fantasy industry now has been concentrating more and more on DFS through the years. And now more and more on, on these best ball leagues that we're talking about, neither of which use the defensive player. So I think because of that, it hasn't been concentrated on as much. And I think there's also something to the defensive player where, you know, it's like a tackle based format and it sometimes influences in things that are not necessarily the most important. Like you're not necessarily drafting the best player. Whereas there's, there's a pretty high correlation between the best fantasy wide receiver and some who someone would think is the best receiver. There's not necessarily that correlation on the defensive side, because you're looking to get these counting stats and a lot of great defensive players don't influence the game through tackles and through other things. They actually influence the game by the ball, not going to them or not getting near them. And there's just no way to account for that in the fantasy format. And, and I mentioned, let's let's wrap with Logan Thomas, who, who really did have a good year. Do you think he'll take another jump or last year was an outlier? No, I, I think he will take another jump. I mean, he's right in the middle of this kind of mid-tier tight end group. I think what's great for him is he had a, he had a ton of targets. So he was targeted a lot last year, but... There weren't many touchdowns. It wasn't, it, it wasn't on that level. I think, again, Fitzpatrick coming there is going to increase the amount of touchdowns that they throw. He is more than willing to throw the ball in the middle of the field. So that's a place where the tight end is, is going to operate. And I think it can be really, really good for, for him this season. Uh, of course, you have this concern, the same concern you have with, with McLaurin as far as a lot of different players that, you know, a lot of mouths to feed, as they say. Um, but I think it's probably less of a concern for him just because tight ends really rely more upon touchdowns. And hopefully he can up that in his game this season. Kevin, this was a lot of fun today. I appreciate you hopping on. Tell the folks where they can find you and what you got coming up next. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, you can find me on Twitter at Kevin Cole PFF. Uh, of course, I'm writing a ton of fantasy articles right now. I'm going through different uh, breakout running backs. I have a series on breakout wide receivers before that. So you can find all my content at pff.com. We appreciate you.